So we have analyzed the, a lot of accuracy of discretization both for the interior of the scheme and for boundary conditions. And, and by the way, I just want to say a little bit more about the boundary conditions. I mean, in a lot of numerical methods class, boundary condition is talked about as if it is kind of a, a, a side note. But boundary conditions are actually, in a lot of sense, more important than how you discretize the interior. If you look at any simulation software, the time and effort spent to discretize and code up all the boundary conditions is usually significantly more. I mean, by significantly more, I mean like something like 20 times as much as the effort and code spent to discretize the differential equation itself. So, and how well you discretize the boundary condition determines everything, like stability of the entire solver actually hinges on if you discretize the boundary conditions correctly. If you didn't do the boundary condition well, it may cause the entire solver to blow up. So, so it's actually a, a very important consideration. And uh, actually, uh, the consideration comes over here is what we discuss here is how stable is finite difference method. We have already analyzed in our last lecture the stability of finite difference methods without boundary conditions. Right? We have analyzed uh, that if you have if you have the eigenvalue of the first order approximation du dx, it lies in a complex plane like this. So lambda is equal to the eigenvalue of the first order derivatives. You have real of lambda, imaginary of lambda. It goes like from here all the way to here, right? So you have many lambdas because we we get a matrix out of discretizing the first order derivative. And the magnitude lies all the way from minus imaginary times 1 over delta x to i times 1 over delta x. Right? So if you want an explicit time integrator, you'd better make sure that the stability region, first of all, let's say if I have a stability region of a pretty good uh, explicit integrator, the stability region usually looks like this. And uh, for, for example, this is on the order of one, maybe two or three, right? Uh, in the space of imaginary lambda delta t and the real of lambda delta t. So if you are solving a finite difference discretized OD using explicit time integration, there is an important relationship that has to be satisfied between delta t and delta x. What is it? So basically, this plot, right? Let me let me just uh, use red to label the eigenvalues. So the values of all these eigenvalues, after scaling it by delta t, has to lie within the stability region, right? So it's this entire thing, after after multiplied by delta t, has to not exceed the stability region of this explicit time integrator. So what does that mean? What relationship has to be satisfied between delta x and delta t? Yeah, so, so this is the magnitude here is 1 over delta x. 
up to multiply by delta t, you have to not exceed this order one, right? Okay, that means my one over delta x, which is here, times delta t, has to be less than this order one number. Oh, this is because this is uh, uh, the stability region of a particular time integration scheme, right? So if you search for uh, actually any explicit time integration scheme would have something like that region of, uh, for example, RK4, right? You get a uh, So if you search for the stability region of any particular scheme, and if you look at uh, images, you get this, uh, you get these pictures like that, right? Yeah, you... This order one means it's a, it, it's a number that does not scale with delta x or delta t. It's a fixed number for that ODE integration scheme, right? So, so for example, uh, this has Ronge Kutta order one, two, three, four, and uh, for Ronge Kutta one is actually forward order. So this blue guy is forward order. We have seen that it ended at uh, minus two, and it's just a circle. It includes no portion of the imaginary axis. So that's automatically ruled out if you want to solve uh, the first order equation using discretized region center sequence. And the RK2 is the red line over here. Actually, it also does not include any portion of the imaginary axis. So three and four, four is the best bet, right? Because it goes all the way to almost the plus minus three. So that means if I'm using RK, RK4, I want to make sure my delta T over delta X has to be less than two point something, right? So this number, this magic stability related number, which is delta t over delta x, okay, uh, in that particular case, multiplied by the wave speed u is called uh, the CFL number. The name CFL is just uh, the first character of three guys who found out the importance of this number almost uh, at the same time. And uh, uh, the, the reason I'm multiplying by u here is that when I'm actually solving the equation, I'm solving the equation of uh, du dt is equal to minus big U times du dx, right? So the eigenvalue I'm actually uh, talking about is actually, uh, so so previously I just uh, imagined the big U is equal to one. So if big U is not equal to one, I need to multiply the eigenvalues of du dx by a big U times delta t. To in order to uh, and want to make sure that fits into the stability region, right? So it's actually u over delta x uh, times delta t less than O1. So the CFL number is uh, the wave speed times delta t over delta x. And uh, if u is negative, I'm just uh, flipping these two ends and put it over here, right, if u is negative. So what really matters is actually the absolute value of u times delta t over delta x. So, so that's the real definition of the cell phone number, is the absolute value of the wave speed, be it negative or positive, times delta x over uh, delta t over delta x. So, so this number is the important number for all stability reasons. All right, and uh, um, if you are using explicit time integration method, 
make sure this number is not too large. Once you see if your cell file number is 10 or something, almost any explicit num uh, time integration scheme is going to diverge. And you'd better switch to implicit. Okay, and if you have a mesh that has different delta x in different regions of your domain, which is almost always the case for uh, CFD simulations, right? I mean, near your boundary, you have small grid size, and in the far field, you have huge grid size. This CFL condition has to be, with the CFL condition, it means that the CFL number less than this constant has to be maintained everywhere in the domain, which means your delta t is constrained by the smallest delta x. Okay, and this is actually why most of our current CFD solvers uses implicit time integration schemes. It, particularly for high Reynolds number of flows where the boundary layer is very thin. So the so boundary layer is very thin means inside the boundary layer you have had to have tiny delta x. Right? Outside, if you go to the far field, you're using huge delta x. But the time step size, if you use explicit time integration scheme, is constrained by the tiniest delta x. And if your Reynolds number is high, your tiniest delta x is pretty tiny. So you would be constrained uh, to use a delta t that is very tiny. That's why most of the uh, CFD solvers nowadays for high Reynolds number flows uses a uh, implicit time integration scheme, so that your cell file number can be set to a hundred or, or two hundred, uh, and you still your solver can still work. All right. So so this is a. Uh, uh, the stability of a finite difference method for first-order equations, for equations with the first-order derivatives. 